Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Welcome to World Green Building Week 2020. My name is Jennifer Whittle and I'm Director of Communications and Engagement at the New Zealand Green Building Council. At this time each year, Green Building Councils from across the globe join together to support the World Green Building Council's annual campaign to focus on better delivery of sustainable greener buildings. This year, GBCs from Europe, the UK, South Africa, India, Malaysia, Singapore and Australia are calling on the building sector, policymakers and government to take bolder action to deliver net zero buildings. Each day this week, our panel discussions touch on issues. Uh, sorry, I'm just not scrolling. There we are. Our panel discussions touch on issues affecting our communities, our planet and our economy from social procurement to health, from sustainable finance to a discussion on shovel ready as an economic stimulus. If you miss any of these webinars, recordings will be available on our website. A warm welcome to all of our members dialing in today. For those of you who are not members, a quick reminder of who we are and our vision for Aotearoa. In Aotearoa, we've continued to make positive steps some of these asks were set down by the NZGBC in our Zero Car Carbon Roadmap that was released in 2019. After years of advocating for strong government action, including the updating of our woeful building code, MB has launched the Building for Climate Change program, promising once in a generation reform. As a sector, we can help make this happen. Please visit our website to review our draft submission, but also please consider making your own. The deadline is the 11th of October. So in 2019-20, there's been great advances for our sector, but we know we can do more. NZGBC continues to call for a trajectory to ensure new buildings are zero carbon by 2030 and mandate the measurement and benchmarking of building performance. As we strive for relevance to, to our international measures, at the NZGBC, we're increasingly asked by our members to support them in their internal discussions as they seek to demonstrate alignment with the UN's Sustainable Development Goals and the Green Building Practices. So this diagram has been developed to show a direct link to nine of the SDGs, including SDG 3, which we're focusing on today, which is health and wellbeing. Thank you again for joining us for World Green Building Week. I'd like to now hand over to our host, Nadine Higgins, who is kind enough to join us again for today's panel discussion. Kia ora everybody, e ngā māna tēnā reo, ngā karanga tēnā maha, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome everybody from me. I'm getting a little bit of feedback in my ear there. Oh, that's a little bit better. Um, hopefully you're all hearing me okay. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for setting the scene. Uh, Namahi everybody and thank you for joining us. Um, if you joined us yesterday to talk about social procurement, welcome back. And if you're joining us for your first webinar of World Green Building Week, hi to my welcome. Um, World Green Building Week comes at a really interesting time this year because obviously we are in the midst of a pandemic um, and also a recession and arguably an economic recovery. And so that brings with it a multitude of challenges. We need to be controlling the health effects of a pandemic. We need to be minimizing the economic impact of a pandemic and a recession, especially on our most vulnerable. But at the same time, we need to be staging this recovery, which could be looked at as an opportunity in a green fashion to limit our emissions um, and look after our climate. So we've got plenty of shovel-ready projects being pitched and being granted funding. There's talk of economic stimulus every other day. It's almost like we've got um, an election around the corner. But that obviously raises the question of how can we do these things better than we have done them before? So today we're focusing on healthy buildings. And the question posed is, are we on the cusp of a healthy building revolution, well-being, workplaces, and the new normal? Now, the new normal is a phrase that we're hearing an awful lot of at the moment during the weird old year that 2020 is. 
But when it comes to our workplaces, it is a new normal because there has been this seismic shift. You know, some people used to work from home and sometimes there was some skepticism around the workplace about how much work was actually being done from home. But what lockdown showed us is what's possible when it's necessary. So I'd like to think there aren't too many more questions around people's productivity when they are working out of the office. Um, and of course, when we had the opportunity to go back to the office, some didn't necessarily want to. So whether at home or in the office, how do we make our workplaces uh, healthy? How do we, how does that working from home shift affect our ability to invest in greener, healthier, shared workplaces? And are our homes actually any healthier than going into the office with all of our workmates? What's the future of open plan offices? How can air conditioning help control our environments? Um, we are lucky to be joined by three, uh, sorry, four uh, wonderful panelists today. I'm going to introduce each of the four of them. And then we are going to spend the, as much of the rest of the hour as we can having a robust debate, um, engaging in discussion, and you are invited to be part of that. So all you have to do is type your question in the Q&A box down the bottom. Please use the Q&A box as opposed to the chat function. We'll be uh, channeling those questions to our four panelists as uh, the hour goes on. So, uh, let's get into it and introduce you to our panellists. First up, uh, Simon Shelton. He is the Senior Project Manager at Antarctica New Zealand. And as you may know, um, Scott Base is actually being redeveloped and the new building on the white content, uh, continent is going to be very green. In fact, um, the Green Building Council has developed a bespoke tool to measure the sustainability of the new Scott Base, which is, of course, a difficult climate in which to operate being the coldest, driest, windiest place on earth. So that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, so we look forward to hearing more from Simon. Thanks for joining us, Simon. Uh, next up, Graham Finlay. Graham is the chairman at Warren and Marnie, which, which is the largest urban design practice in New Zealand. And Graham was also involved in establishing the Green Building Council and has led Warren and Marnie's sustainability strategy. And that is a significant sustainability strategy because not only have they been carbon zero for the past 12 years, their goal is that all new projects they design will be net carbon zero in operation, 50% more energy efficient and have 40% less embodied carbon by 2030. So a big, chunky, ambitious goal. Welcome to you, Graham. Also joining us is Richard Hilder, who is the Chief Financial Officer at Precinct Properties. And he's also the chair of Precinct's Sustainability Committee. And Precinct, if you're not familiar with them, you will no doubt be familiar with some of their buildings. Uh, they are New Zealand's largest owner of inner city business space and major developments like the PwC Tower at Commercial Bay, the ANZ Tower, I think it's number 10 Madden Street down in what is becoming a quite beautiful uh, Wynyard Quarter and home of many green buildings. And I believe that one there is, and probably many others, designed by Warren and Marnie. So welcome to you, Richard. And last but not least, Carolyn Cox. She is the founder of Green Business HQ. She's a sustainability consultant for businesses right from small and medium-sized enterprises through to big guys like Mitre 10 and the City Rail Link. And so she writes climate action plans for communities as well. So thank you very much for joining us, Carolyn. Um, I'm going to give each of our panelists about three or four minutes to set the scene. Some have slides, some don't. Um, so let's start with Simon Shelton from Antarctica, New Zealand. Over to you. Thank you. Can, can everyone see my screen? Nadine, can you see that? Good. So uh, thanks very much for having me here. It's um, great to share our uh, project with, with um, all that are online. So in 2015, um, Antarctica New Zealand initiated a, a project to redevelop Scott Base. So it was um, the current base is over 40 years old and uh, much of the infrastructure was deteriorating and causing us a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, both cost, but also um, labour and, um, and and increased risk, particularly over winter. 
So um, at the outset, we um, developed five strategic objectives. Two of them really focused on um, protection of the environment and keeping our people safe and healthy. So those have um, stuck with the project and been um, robustly tested through two business cases and about to be tested on the third. So that's really um, uh, driven and um, crystallised Antarctic and New Zealand's passion for protection of the environment um, and um, helped us to, de to develop the tool that Nadine mentioned before with the New Zealand Green, Green Building Council to have, it, um, to have the design and construction independently assessed and, and rated. So um, what makes what makes Scott Base unique is the fact that we have um, people living and working down there um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and have done since 1957. So I mentioned it to, um, to our team before that it's like working at home to the extreme. So you're in a really um, remote and hostile location. You're down there for um, extended periods, some up to 13 months. You have four months of total darkness where you can't see your hands. Um, when you walk um, you know, outside, it's absolutely pitch black. So that does have an impact on um, those who are living and working down there, particularly for winter. And you have things called seasonal effect disorder or um, the polar T3 syndrome. Um, so we, we know that it does um, have an impact on mental health. So we've um, set ourselves some lofty goals to try and um, reduce the impact of that as much as possible. So when we look at the design, as you see in front of us, it's three interconnected buildings with, um, connected by two linkways, but it's really what um, goes on inside the building, uh, particularly the spaces to work. So that's really functional workshops, and uh, but it's also bedrooms that provide people with um, some solace to um, relax and recharge after the day, or areas where they can um, connect with other people on base and, and you know, read a book or, or listen to some music. So this is really important. It also helps us to um, have a sustainable workforce, so people that want to work down there um, for uh, more than just one season. So what that means when we're um, uh, working um, through our design requirements, that's looking at occupant comfort, it's looking at social, um, sporting and respite opportunities both inside and outside the base, it's looking at healthy products, some that have smells, so people get um, other sensory um, stimulation, uh, it's looking at warm materials, uh, so we don't want it to be institutionalised in quite you know, a cold store. Um, we look at thermal, um, we look at lighting and visual comfort. So um, material selection is critical, but um, spatial layout and, um, and having the balance between functional spaces for work, but also areas where you know, they do have a homely feel where people um, feel like they are leaving work. We have to balance circadian rhythm so winter so people know when it's the night because you know it's absolutely pitch black the whole time. We also work really closely with a group called Mata looking at cultural design um, and how that's reflected in both the building layouts, the naming of them, um, particular art pieces um, and so that it's done um, and uh, so it educates users of the base. So um, we have a mantra that um, goes, we look to our past to face our future. And scientific endeavor really supports the, um, the message um, and our involvement both with Marapopuri, but also the Antarctic Heritage Trust. We've um, worked, uh, we've got a, a wind farm um, down in Antarctica at the moment that we share with the uh, National Science Foundation. So that's the, um, that's the American base, um, Murdo, far larger than um, Scott base, um, and the current wind farm has a design life through to 2030. We've made some really major changes in the new base where we're looking to use electric boilers so we can really maximise renewable energy. But that means we use, um, so that means um, when we're looking to replace the current wind farm, we're considering um, how we can capitalise on renewable energy for heating, uh, things like electric boilers. So that's also part of the scope of um, replacing the new base. So that's a, a quick overview of, um, of how we're considering um, the design and um, the users of the base. Um, but I'm happy to go into a bit more detail as questions come through and, 
and talk about how we consider some of the impacts and future needs. Almost made the fatal mistake of starting to talk while um, I was on mute, but not quite. Um, thank you very much, Simon. Let's move next to Graham Finlay from Warren and Marnie. If you'd like to give us your scene setter, please. Okay. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I don't have any slides. So, um, and an architect without any slides is, is feels feels very wrong. Um, I'm going to speak from a perspective of both an employer but also as a architect. So um, we're urban designers, but we're also architects and interior designers. So we're working in all different scales. And um, look, I, I truly believe we are in a period of transformation, quite an exciting period. I think it's coming from the top down at political and governance level, and also from the bottom up, people are voting with their feet. Um, and, and I think there's a number of reasons for that. Um, I mean, one, just a little fact to, to, to get everyone thinking. If you were born before 1987, the world population will have increased by 50% in your lifetime. If you were born before 1973, the global population will have doubled in your lifetime. Um, and that really gives you an idea of, of some of the challenges that we're dealing with. The rapid growth we've experienced globally is creating its own dynamic. The growth of our cities, the growth and scale of our organizations and our businesses, the growth of our floor plates, they're all leading to a point where scale is beginning to challenge quality of life. It's beginning to challenge health and productivity of organizations as well. So the question I think society is asking of designers is how can we do scale better? Um, changes to legislation is also beginning to change things. So it's meant that mental and physical health of employees is becoming a regular conversation at board level. Um, as a result, as designers, we're seeing organizations taking the impact of their workplaces and the health and safety, uh, and the health of their staff much more seriously. So it, it's also gonna be very interesting to see the impact that recent introduction of carbon reporting for organizations and portfolio owners is, is actually going to, what it will do to the conversations in boardrooms and what it will therefore do to the um, briefs that we receive as, as designers for buildings and, and, um, and internal workplaces. So in our seven studios, um, and I'm sure we're no different from any other business, many of our staff are wanting more flexibility to achieve a better balance between work and life. They also, I think, want to be part of an organisation which cares about something cares about the community, cares about the environment, wants to be part of a solution, not a problem. And, and COVID has provided a distance working and flexible working engagement, and it's proved that they can be very efficient. It's actually given people choices. So like it or not, post COVID, businesses and workplaces are gonna need to work a lot harder to attract people to them. And in designing workspaces, we're gonna have to consider that. How, how can we attract people who can easily work from home to come into the office, to interact with their colleagues um, and to be part of a team. So we're gonna to have to make our workplaces far more attractive and, and being healthier, being more environmentally friendly is very much part of that equation. Um, in a globalized market, the competition for talent and people both at a city and business level is also absolutely changing perspective. In a world where a job for life is actually very rare now, and where people are genuinely mobile, cities and businesses need to compete much more overtly than they have done in the past. And if you want evidence of that, you just really need to look at the amount of investment that is going into urban design of our cities like Melbourne, Auckland, Sydney, more recently Christchurch, and a little while ago Wellington, all trying to be the best place to live, the best place to work. And they need to deliver on an aspiration of a younger, more health and environmentally conscious generation. So I think there is a stimulus for change. So what, what, what's the result of that for us? Well, we're seeing a shift in priority um, from our clients um, and a shift in the dialogue from purely economic and engineering sort of based solutions to a conversation much more about the humanistic and, and the outcome of the solution you're providing. What are you actually trying to achieve? The conversation from our clients, and this is a really crass example, but is moving from how can I fit as many people into my building for the minimum cost um, 
to how can I attract and retain the best people and enable them to deliver their work more efficiently and effectively. So really the quality of the working environment, the daylight, the outlook, the amenity, they're all critical parts of that equation. At an urban and infrastructure scale, the change is actually quite similar. The conversation used to be, how can I move people from A to B in the fastest way for the least amount of investment? Now the conversation is turning to how can my transport solution connect and enhance a community and, and make the city more livable um, and improve the environment. So the conversation is changing. Design is becoming much more focused at the actual intended outcome rather than sometimes the, the, the things that the process of designing and, and the metrics of designing. So the intended outcomes, community, a lifestyle, health, productivity of a, of a workplace and a, and, and a better environment to live in. So it, it seems obvious and, and you think it's something that's always been dialogue, but I do believe that we are in a bit of a seismic change at the moment. I think in, in sort of summary, society is actually looking for better buildings and better cities now. And that's that that makes it sound very positive and seems to suggest that we are on the cusp of a green building revolution. Um, Richard Hilda from Precinct Properties, I'll come to you next. I imagine based on what Graham was saying about wanting to provide quality buildings, that's squarely the space that you operate in. Uh, thanks, Nadine, and good afternoon, everyone. Yes, that's uh, absolutely true. Um, I'll just share this screen uh, with your uh, Hopefully you can see, see that. Uh, yes, we are in the business of uh, developing uh, premium assets and then being a long-term owner of those assets. Um, and this is uh, pretty dear to our, our heart. Um, we've been uh, developing uh, a sustainability framework for a number of years now that really uh, is the backbone of our uh, business strategy as a, as a whole. Um, we've focused on three main areas being um, the development and design of, of, our, of our buildings, uh, operational excellence um, and the people that uh, work in our buildings but also the community that, that, we, that we are part of. Um, in terms of that framework, we, we look at a, a number of um, kind of material topics um, that sit within that. Um, there's the obvious ones being environment um, and, and a real focus on Neighbours NZ um, and also Green Star um, and, and improving um, our, our energy um, emissions intensity and reducing that um, over time. Um, we also have a focus on health and safety and, and uh, working out a construction on site um, and also, as I mentioned, community. So we've supported City Mission in both Wellington and Auckland for, for, for a number of years now. Um, but client well-being is one that's on the top of our list, and I'll touch on that um, on the next slide. Um, it's, it's hugely important to our, our overall strategy. Um, in terms of the progress that we've made over the last few years, it's been enormous. Um, it's been led by both the management team, um, our board, um, our stakeholders, both uh, um, our investors, both debt and equity. Um, and also, importantly, um, our, our clients who occupy our space. Um, and this has seen us, um, you know, make some big improvements um, to the way that we, that we do report um, to investors and how we uh, approach our, our buildings. Um, this year, we've moved to zero carbon, um, which we're very proud of. Um, we're supporting the Home Ground uh, project, uh, which is a city mission project up in, in Auckland. Um, and then we recently committed to a, a new development in uh, Wellington um, at 40 Bowen campus. Um, and this is the first building that we've actually gone and measured the amount of embodied carbon that, we, that we're putting into that development with a view to, uh, to offset that carbon, which is a, is a good start um, in the process. Um, I think over time it would be nice to be able to reduce the amount of embodied carbon um, with, with different materials and construction. I touched on um, client wellbeing. For us, client wellbeing is the, the most important um, material topic um, or sustainability topic for us. It's one that we can have the most impact on, so we can have uh, a real impact on, on the, the clients that occupy our space. 
but it also has the biggest impact on our, on our business, both operationally and from a financial performance perspective. Um, and we've got there effectively through feedback from our, um, our client base, both uh, our pre-commitment clients in, in uh, say, Commercial Bay um, or uh, the government assets down in, in Wellington. Um, and they all have the same feedback about what they want um, around energy efficiency, building design, um, amenity, public space. Um, and, and really that's what's um, cemented what we're trying to do um, with our underlying strategy um, across every aspect of, of what, we, what we're doing, whether it be development or operation. Um, and I think if, if you don't focus on this, this is a, this is a huge risk. Um, it's, it's something that is emerging and, and if, if you don't, as a property owner, move with the times, you'll find that your buildings become quite obsolete. Um, obsolete from um, the fact that you can't sell them. Uh, a lot of international buyers require a, a green building um, funding. Um, banks and uh, other debt providers have this as a, as a kind of due diligence question pretty quickly in, in the process. Um, the same with equity um, investors. Um, and, but most importantly for us, it's the, the clients or the tenants um, within our, our buildings. Um, nearly every RFP um, that we would see will have a, a requirement or a question around uh, your, your, your intention around green or how green the building is. Um, moving on to our strategy and how that's incorporated. Effectively, wellbeing is across all, everything that we've done in the last um, several years. Um, the Commercial Bay development um, was focused entirely on this idea of um, attracting talent, having amenity uh, in and around the location, having floor plates that have natural light, um, that are energy efficient, that allow for different uh, workplace um, uh, approaches and solutions. Um, the, I think a lot of people probably aren't aware of also what we're trying to build around Commercial Bay. So Commercial Bay is a community of five towers. It's 10,000 people. And where we see the benefit for us is, is bringing those people together. It's a reason why you want to come into the office and be part of that community, both as part of your workspace, but as a, as a wider group. Um, and we've, we're trying to develop that through what we have as a, as a club. So it's a club of the 10,000 workers in that space um, and effectively creating uh, environments where that they can they can meet um, and, and be part of. Um, we've also gone a bit further in the last few years. We've, we've bought um, a business um, called Generator. We've owned that for a number of years now um, and we are expanding it. So we're expanding it uh, almost doubling the size into Wellington, into the Wellington market. And that's all about uh, listening to the clients around agile working, how they want to work, um, event space, um, and, and adapting to the, the changing um, environment um, of, of how clients uh, see their space. Um, and then the last one I've, I've had here is uh, our end of trip facilities. So we've spent a significant amount of money upgrading our buildings, uh, both in Auckland and Wellington, and again, that's to, for the well-being of the clients uh, that we have, and they want better end of trip um, facilities um, and better lobbies, um, end of trips for arrival uh, at work, um, more showers, more lockers, um, and just having a better environment environment to work in. So that's the end of that, Nadine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Some interesting points raised there that hopefully we can weave into the discussion as the hour progresses. So last but not least, Carolyn Cox, the Director of Green Business HQ, uh, your scene setter, please. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I guess top of mind for me at the moment is definitely climate change and inequality. I know we're kind of all focused on COVID-19, but for me, climate change feels like the biggest thing that we're facing. And um, I really agree with the other speakers and this is just such an, an exciting but uncertain time <laughs> um, where we've got this 
fluidity in how we're working, how our businesses are operating, where we can begin to build something new and something different. And as you can probably tell from the greenery behind me, um, and the dark face with all the light behind me, apologies, is um, I work from home and I have done for five years. Um, over the last month or so, I've been working on a climate action plan for the Henderson Massey Local Board. And as part of that, I've been doing a lot of consultation, one-on-one, -on -one, running meetings with a lot of people in different organisations. And the vast majority of those people um, have been working from home. And so I think it's important that we also have a conversation about the home as a, work, a workplace and have a, a think about the mental health and the physical health impacts of that. Because we know that the standard of our housing in New Zealand is not great. And especially for Maori and Pacifica communities, we know that a third, over a third of those homes are both damp and mouldy. Um, and we also know that there's overcrowding. So when you're faced with the choice to work from home, you gain a lot and that you, you know, you avoid having to commute and sit in Auckland's trap, like especially if you live in Auckland's North Shore at the moment. But um, if you're suddenly having to work in crowded, damp, cold conditions, and instead of going into a nice, warm workspace, you're having to heat your own home or to operate in somewhere that's not that great for your health. And I think we need to be conscious of that as well. So I think that's something that employers and those that are managing workplaces should be thinking about as well. Is the workplace set up for my employees at home good for them? And there's physical things in terms of the setup of our computers and our desks or our ironing boards, depending on how we're working. Um, so that whole transformation of our workplaces, whether they be at home or whether they be within commercial buildings, um, and transforming how they are powered. Um, I think it's really interesting at the moment. And so for so long, I've been advising businesses. You know, for over 20 years, I've been advising businesses around sustainability and that transition and creating pathways and plans for them. And there's always so many barriers in place, um, often financial. And I really do think We've really hit a sense of urgency now where we need to put more regulation in place. So I'm really excited to see that we have the whole Building for Climate Change program coming from NB because um, we can't afford to be doing so much construction. We've, we're putting billions of dollars into infrastructure and construction at the moment around me in Mount Albert where I live. Um, there's whole blocks being um, demolished over the last few months and um, a lot of new housing going in. And it's really great to see that they're doing home star, sit star. And no doubt there'll be people working from those homes as well. Um, but if we don't have the regulation in place, we're still doing stuff that's substandard. We can't afford to keep doing stuff at building code anymore for our, for our health, whether we're working at home or working in the workplace. Um, I've been doing climate talks in schools and um, mainly with high school students, because I'm noticing that people are coming out of high school into tertiary study, not, not knowing or understanding much about climate change. And I find that really deeply concerning, given the urgency of the response that we need to make. Um, so I've been surveying the students before and after I do the climate talks with them, just to get a gauge on you know, how much they know and what do they know about the solutions? And the thing that's coming through really strongly is that these students, you know, who will soon, you know, in the next couple of years be entering the workforce or becoming entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs or whatever they may be. But the thing that I'm noticing is that they're really aware of the problem of climate change. And they're, often they're really enthusiastic about being part of the solution to that, but they're not really aware about what the solutions are. And we know that the built environment, that our commercial buildings and our residential buildings are a big part of that solution. That's where most of our energy is being consumed. Um, and so it concerns me that they're not learning about what the solutions are. And I think as grown-ups, maybe that's our problem because we're not painting a really positive picture about what the future is you know what is the future of the workplace and you know Graham your point about you know attracting people to the workplace you know are these workplaces that we're creating at the moment going to be the kind of places that these young people want to work there's so much evidence around 
you know, mental health and having, you know, the, the green vista that I've got at home. Um, so, you know, the quality of the air, we, you know, as soon as you go into a green star building, we've got that air change rate just makes such a huge difference, doesn't it? Um, but I'm still going into workplaces and buildings where the lighting is terrible, where the air quality is ter terrible, where there's meeting rooms with no external ventilation and people are half asleep. Um, I need to get one of those monitors to read what the oxygen levels are in some of those rooms. We've got so many spaces that have been subdivided and redivided so that the lighting, floor plate design and the air conditioning design has no bearing on what's actually there in reality in that workplace. So I think we've got some real work to do, not just on the new builds that we're doing, but also on retrofit and investing in that so that we do have healthy workplaces that we really want to be in. Because if you've got a workplace that's got terrible air quality and is pretty dingy, I think I would choose working from home. That's probably enough for me. <laughs> You've raised some excellent points there, Carolyn, I think. And not only is it the inequality of um, overcrowded houses um, in terms of working from home, I was also sparing a thought from the younger members of the workforce who might be at home with five or six flatmates working <laughs> from the kitchen. Um, and that isn't necessarily, and they miss out, I guess, on um, learning some of the lessons about how other people work because they don't see them. It's a little different when you've been in the workforce for a little while. But anyway, thank you very much for those opening statements. Uh, the question uh, and answer function is now open. So please send your questions in and uh, we'll put as many of them as possible to our panel before the hour is out. I wondered if I could get us started because I read um, a headline on CNN just recently that uh, read the office as you know it is dead. And I just wondered if some of you might have a view on that, um, whether it is in fact dead or whether it's likely to return to the norms we were used to before at any point, or whether that seismic shift um, is now permanent. Um, perhaps um, maybe we could start with Graham. Um, would you like to climb into that question? Yeah, yeah. Look, I think that's a bit sensationalist. I don't think the office as we know it has ceased to exist, but I think it will transform and I think it'll adapt. And I think over what, what there, there has been a move towards um, something called activity based design, which um, I think is really finding its own position now in a, in a more flexible environment. And it's a, a design where not everyone necessarily sits at a desk. You have different types of settings and um, it, it allows for much more flexibility. It actually allows for some of your workforce to be off and then come in because people don't have these fixed spaces. Um, it doesn't necessarily result in a smaller floor plate. It doesn't necessarily result in a cheaper build, but it could do. Um, but, but it does mean that if you're wanting to have a conversation, you can go and sit in a lounge setting. If you want to do some quiet work, there's somewhere you can do some quiet work. If you want to do some quiet work with someone else, there's, there's spaces that you can do. So different settings for different types of activity. And I think we will see that becoming more prevalent in, um, in, in, in workplaces. So that might be one of the first things. And I, I know, Richard, um, your generator spaces uh, really have a lot of that, and that's a lot, a lot of the concept behind them. Um, and so we, I think we will see a, a move towards fl more flexible working space. Richard, I imagine you're very much going to tell me that the office is not dead. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a little bit biased to that question, um, but no, yes, I think it's a bit of a sensationalist um, a approach. Um, look, it is a change, um, and I think the, the, the lockdowns showed that, yes, you can work from home, um, but the feedback that we're getting back from our occupiers now, now is they're, they're struggling with company culture um, and collaboration and and issues that are created when your entire workforce are away from the office. Um, I think as a, as a permanent 
um, solution. I don't think that's that that works um, for a, for a high performing business that's trying to create uh, culture, um, especially around mentoring younger people through a business um, and, and growing them. Um, I do think that there is a shift, um, but I think that shift has been going on for some time. Um, an example is PwC, where they the, the the space that they have taken next door in our, in our tower. They've had 900 people in Auckland, but they've designed it for 450 people on floor any time. So uh, there is that approach and, and that's been underway for some time. Um, we've also seen in the last um, two months, we've leased about 10,000 square meters of new, new leases to traditional occupiers on long-term leases, um, both local and, and overseas. So there's still a demand for that. But what is interesting is that um, demand for agile or flexibility. So EY in Wellington, um, they've committed to about 3,000 square meters of space. But as part of that um, commitment, they wanted flexibility um, and uh, effectively, uh, we, we have put in a generator facility within their building to, to allow for them to, to have that flexibility and allow the workforce to, to work in a different way. Um, Carolyn, I'm interested in your take. The businesses that you're working with, how many of them are looking at the sustainability of their workplace beyond the actual um, building? Because I was interested in what Richard was saying about retrofitting some of their businesses to allow people to, for example, have a shower if they've commuted by bike. And I've worked in a beautiful green building before and it had one shower for the whole building. And I just wonder whether businesses are starting to focus on those um, other green initiatives that allow the overall operation of the workforce to be greener. Oh, definitely. Um, one of the programs that I run is called STARS. It's specifically designed for small to medium sized businesses. And um, we work with them over six months and create a full sustainability plan with them. And we're definitely looking even with smaller businesses right across um, their operations and very strongly looking around climate and waste, um, regardless of that's in terms of, you know, the space they're operating and, and how their staff are getting to and from it and how they work from the site, as well as through their pro products, supply chain and looking at sustainable procurement and social procurement as part of that as well. Um, and I think employers are very conscious about how people are getting to their workspaces and wanting to have facilities there. Um, a lot of those smaller businesses are obviously very beholden to <laughs> the buildings that they've chosen to lease and depending on how their lease, long their lease is, um, there's not sometimes enough leverage to get the changes in place that they would like to see around maybe you know, shared compost collection or cycling facilities or some changes to their lighting. Um, but uh, as, as these guys are definitely showing, there's, there's the um, support coming through that as well. So there's not as much resistance as there has been in the past to those positive changes that we can make. Simon, I wondered if we could bring you in here because when you spoke about um, Scott Base, you sort of talked that it's a, it's a very intense environment. You're kind of almost working from home around the clock and you're having to be mindful of all those other impacts on people's well-being. And so I wondered if from your experience, you might actually have some lessons from other businesses who might only be starting to think about it as a result of COVID. Yeah, particularly um, working and living in the same place. Is that what you're referring to, Nadine? Yes, very much so. Yeah. But also, I guess, um, you know, you're talking about the darkness and um, some things that obviously we don't have to deal with, but it does force you as an employer to think about the overall well-being of your staff and how you can mitigate the negative impacts of their work environment. Yeah, I think um, we, we, we do a lot of work with, um, in leadership and also um, uh, I've had two winters down at Scott Base and um, they taught me a lot more about myself. So, you know, the introvert versus extrovert and respecting other people's space when they need some quiet time or want to um, get energy from hanging out with people. So 
I think it's a little bit like the um, the first question or the sensationalist headline that you referred to as the um, about the the workplace as we know it is it over. I think it's more about having spaces that can accommodate different needs at different times. But particularly at Scott Base, that means a really effective place to you know perhaps fix a, a bulldozer to um, work out the helicopter operations direct um, air traffic or um, to um, sit down and eat a meal and socialise, um, whether it's um, with a group or by yourself, but to provide the, the mixed use space. Um, so we, we, we um, try to make the building as flexible as possible, bearing in mind that we have up to 100 people there in summer and then down to 12 over winter. So we don't want a ghost town over winter and we don't want something somewhere that's overcrowded through summer. So it's about trying to shut down the space and such to make it feel like it's fit for purpose. It's interesting, Simon, that you mentioned the introverts versus the extroverts. There's a question here from Nigel. How do we design open space slash collaborative workspaces that allow for the introvert when most of the designers and decision makers are extroverts, or are they? <laughs> that might be a question for you, Graham. Is that the, the introverted or extroverted nature or otherwise of staff in mind when you're designing a workplace? Look, uh, it, it is. Um, I think. I think. Yeah. I don't. I don't think all designers and decision makers are extroverts. I, I, I have to sort of. Um, but I think that's where we need to move away from thinking about open plan. I think open plan wasn't a successful solution um, as it was introduced, and and I think the the thinking or designing to create different spaces for different activities, much like if you were working from home and if you imagine your day at home, you might pick up your laptop and go work up in, in, in an office in, in your, at a desk in your room. You might go down to the kitchen table and um, have a coffee and chat with someone about something you're doing. You might go into the living room and sit in a comfortable seat and read some papers. You sort of move around your home when you've got the choice into different environments to suit the thing that you're doing. In an office environment, we kind of put people in pigeonholes in this, in this office and, and crammed as many people as possible into a space and said, yeah, that will work, it's all gonna be fine. That's when you get the problem between the introverts and the extroverts. And I think when we're this this change in design is actually this thinking has been going on for quite some time, but I I do think we're going to see a much quicker shift in the way these spaces are designed. So um, I do think they can be designed for introverts as well and successful for introverts, but it does depend on the quality of design. As a tangent to that, um, there's a question from an anonymous attendee about whether you have any comments around indoor planting and work environments, because I think often in particularly open plan work environments, plants are employed as a way of creating spaces. But this attendee would like to know about the science um, of their effect on well-being. Would that be perhaps a question for you, Carolyn? Um. The science and the statistics, no, because I don't think them in mind. But I've definitely seen lots of papers and articles proving that the architects in the room will be better at explaining this than me. But just, you know, even just having that line of sight is really important to outdoor spaces. And, you know, um, plants are creating oxygen and they're absorbing pollutants. So, um, and just having that connection with na nature in terms of our mental health, I think it's really important. So. Yeah, definitely um, a positive. It does pay to have some care regime in place because <laughs> there's nothing like a half dead pot plant in the office to really not <laughs> get the intended um, outcome. <laughs> Always better than a plastic plant, though, right? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> oh, plastic plants, please, people. I hate them. You go into those cafes and they've got the whole plastic green wall. What's that? That's just wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, Graham or Richard, do you have any thoughts on the use of greenery in workplaces?
Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, look, I, I, do, I don't have a, I think there is certainly a desire um, uh, to bring planting into workplace environments. I think there's, um, the, there is, a, as um, Carolyn says, there's a lot of uh, scientific papers. It's, a, it's an interesting discussion with your mechanical engineer when you try and um, introduce the idea and say it's going to improve air quality. Um, they don't generally support you in it, but um, I, I, look, I think it is something that people like and people connect with well. I'm sure it must improve the air quality, and I know there was a lot of studies on spider plants and things like that years ago about how, how they were particularly good um, uh, plants at, at fil filtering um, toxins from the air. Uh, so yeah, look, it's a, it's a it's it's a great thing to involve with in in design. I would say. Just while we're talking to you, Graham, Richard mentioned uh, in his introduction that there's this impetus for green buildings because, you know, unless they're green, they're difficult to sell, uh, to get investment, to borrow. So, is there anything coming through your pipeline of work? that isn't green or, or do you just simply turn away work because you've got that focus now on working with your clients to ensure that they're developing greener buildings? Um, <clears throat> no, look, I think um, Precinct is a, is a leader in the market rather than a follower in the market. I'm, I'm sorry, Richard, I'm speaking for you, but, but Precinct has really strong credentials. And, and, but if you look at the best portfolio owners and developers internationally, you'll find that they're all focusing on the long term and, and have taken sort of very proactive approaches. So, um, I, but there is a big mix in the market. So we've got, um, there's, a, there's a, a lot of developers still out there who would like to just ignore all that and design the cheapest thing they can get away with. Um, there is a question here from an attendee for Simon. This is from Timothy. Um, how has the well framework been considered as part of the design process for the new Scott base? Yeah, so um, in 2016, because of our um, strategic objectives and the um, passion for protecting the environment, Antarctic New Zealand wanted to choose a tool um, to have um, this um, both to, to challenge us and our design team, but also for independent verification. So we looked at a range uh, from LEED, um, uh, Brianne, the British Antarctic Survey had worked with, um, but we, in the end we landed on uh, working with the New Zealand Green Building Council and developing the bespoke tool because the, the tool that's set up for a maritime climate or a commercial building in New Zealand isn't fit for purpose, so it's things like um, providing perhaps um, being able to bike to work and park your bike. We can't do that in Antarctica, so there are some things that weren't um, relevant. So we had, um, uh, we had three full days of workshopping and making sure that the tool was fit for purpose, and we're now um, providing that to other national Antarctic programs to show leadership in the environmental and construction space um, because there's over 70% of the bases in, uh, across the continent are undergoing some form of redevelopment. So we really, really want to challenge other national Antarctic programs to think about you know, the, the, um, the benefits of, of, a, uh, of a green building in the, in the coldest, driest, harshest continent in the world. What about the air, Simon? Carolyn talked about um, you know, offices that have maybe no natural light, no airflow. How does that work in the Antarctic environment and how have you factored that into your plans for the new building? Yeah, I did pick up on Carolyn's um, comment there because it's really important to us because air um, comes into the building sometimes at minus 55 degrees. So um, the more cold air we bring in, the more energy you use to heat it. So um, we actually um, very closely monitor um, oxygen saturation of the air within the building, so we minimise the amount of um, air that we're bringing in from the outside. So we do recirculate, but because of that, we can we have um, a high degree of control over the, the space. Um, so air quality is is really important. Um, we also look to shut down uh, bedrooms over winter, so we can reduce the temperature in certain areas of the base. Uh, but that that's it's the it's a really, really dry climate. So we're also looking at humidification of the air. Um, so you don't get static shocks with everything 
metal that you touch, but also just for simple things like um, your skin dries out and you, you, you know, your, your hair and everything. It takes about a month to acquire um, There's a few questions coming in from attendees about kind of the culture that accompanies um, a shift to flexible working and greener working practices. I don't know, Carolyn, whether this is something that you uh, work with some of the enterprises um, that you draw up plans for, but how this anonymous attendee says, how do you ensure that the company's culture matches the company's standing on flexible working? Um, worked, workspaces shift to the flexible workplaces, but don't change the culture, which can result in overcrowding, unfriendly relationships within the workplace. And then um, someone else asking about the opinion of the four day working week and the positive impact on the overall well-being of staff. Do you have any thoughts there, Carolyn? Um, I, I guess if you've got a good culture before you go into this environment, then you've done you've done the groundwork for it, for, for it to continue in these different circumstances. I've, I think there's been some great leadership shown in different organisations that I've seen over the last few months where um, people are really supporting and enabling their workforce to work from home. And, you know, if we're not coming together in our physical workspace as much as we used to, then it does place some responsibility, I think, on our leaders and managers to actually reach out and connect with people and with their teams. And, you know, to still be able to have that sense of fun and camaraderie that you can get in the office or, you know, in the lunchroom around the coffee, um, I think it's really important to, you know, making work fun. We spend so much of our lives working that, if we can't enjoy that, no matter whether we're at home or in the workplace, then something's pretty bad in life, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I'm aware that we're rapidly running out of time. I wondered this might be a good one to wrap up the hour on. And Jamie would like to know, regulation versus culture versus education, considering the division worldwide between those who want less regulation and being told what to do versus those who want more control over individual freedoms. If we're talking about being on the cusp of this green building revolution, is it going to be driven by regulation or is it going to be driven by consumer demand um, or somewhere else, something else? Um, Richard, I can see you nodding your head. Do you want to wade in there? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I thought regulation would probably go ahead of um, other factors, but uh, the more I've delved into this and, and we're actually being pushed along faster by our stakeholders uh, much quicker than uh, the government is, is moving. So um, in terms of our reporting against TCFD, um, we're ahead of probably where the government will be on, on that. Um, I see MB uh, have put out work around um, carbon uh, operating uh, emissions um, for new buildings um, and also embodied carbon. Um, and I, I, feel, I feel like we're a few years ahead of, of, of that um, movement as well. So it's quite, it's actually nice to see it's it's more our stakeholders um, across the board pushing us rather than uh, being told by uh, the government of, of what to do. Does anyone else have some thoughts there on regulation versus other drivers for the green building revolution? We've stunned them all into silence. I guess then that seems like an appropriate place to leave the hour. Um, thank you so much to our panellists, Simon, Graham, Carolyn and Richard. And I also need to say a quick shout out to the sponsors who are making Green Building Week and the events contained within it possible, um, including Rubik's and Temper Zone and also Resine, Jib and Auckland Conversations. So um, a socially distanced round of applause for... Uh, the sponsors for sticking with it and allowing some important conversations to be happening online. Thank you for having me as your MC. Uh, Namahi nui, hei kona, kia pai tora.